Hi everyone, welcome to another episode um, with me, Dr. Sylvia. Um, this is Ask Away Health and we're talking about fibroids today. As you know, we're celebrating or marking Fibroids Awareness Month all through the month of July. And today I've got a special treat for you. So it's not just me talking, you're going to be hearing from an expert about common questions with regards to fibroids. So I'm not going to take too much of your time doing introduction, um, but I hope you guys are doing well. And I hope you've enjoyed the videos and the different um, publications, the different um, resources we've been sharing all through the last week, um, the very first week of July, um, as we mark Fibroids Awareness Month. So this, um, this video is going to be looking at some of the common questions about fibroids. There's still many, many women who don't know what these um, this condition is about so we're going to talk about them in some detail in some uh, to some extent and there might be ladies who have had fibroids for years but still have things that they're not very sure about so i'm sure this session is going to be particularly of value to everyone that's listening in please give this video a like and of course subscribe to our channel as we go along and if you've got any questions let us know um, by sending questions to our email health information service if you've got any clarifications that you want to make if you have any comments we'd love to hear back from you in the comment section below so today we have a special guest a seasoned obstetrician and gynecologist with interest in ambulatory gynecology medical education and complex obstetrics so there is a lot of knowledge packed in this wonderful lady focused spe specifically on preterm birth and benign vulval disease. So I'm happy, I'm really happy to introduce to you today, Dr. Tolu Adedikbe, who is on screen with us now. Hi, Dr. Tolu, welcome. Hello, Dr. Sylvia. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much for inviting me on board. You guys are doing such a fantastic work and thank I you. love to you know, follow you and see what you update her very That's refreshing very informative thank you so much for the good work thank you so you. much thank you it's a privilege and honor to have you on with us today of course fibroids is one of those conditions that um, women have to contend with so we're just going to jump straight into that and i just want to mention as well guys that um please go ahead and follow dr tolu um on instagram she is there as at vulva doc as you can see on her profile um, on the screen and um, she shares lots of in, in, um, useful and interesting information about the work that she does. Okay, so we're just going to get started. I'm just going to pull up our um, slides for today and we've got a series of questions um, that we're going to um, address that we're going to address as we go on this chat. So Dr. Tolu, let's just start with the first slide, which is this one, right? Which you can see. Okay, so should I let you go ahead? Yeah. Yes, please. So the first slide essentially is just to give us a picture format of what fibroids look like. So as you can see, that's the uterus with the two ovaries, um, one on either side, and then you can see the vagina down below. And the little balls that you can see um, highlighted or signposted are the fibroids telling you where they can be within the uterus. Now, before I go any further, I think um, I will go on to the next slide and then we might revert back to this slide as and when. Okay, so, all right, the next slide. What is a fibroid is the next question. A lot of women have heard of the word fibroids, but oftentimes what it actually is, is what is a little bit um, not so clear. Mm -hmm. I want to reassure anybody listening to me, fibroids are benign tumors. So, of course, if you hear the word tumor, you think it's cancer. Not at all. So most fibroids are benign growths, you know, within the muscle, within the, the wall of the womb, as it were. And I'm, really glad, to... I'm really glad to you emphasize that because that is a big worry that women have once, as you said, you hear the word tumor. So you start thinking, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Go on, please. You know, and they're very estrogen dependent. So there are two principal hormones in any woman. That is any person born as a woman so i have to clarify that as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, we've got the progesterone mm -hmm. or progesterone and we've then got the estrogen and the fibroids are very estrogen dependent we know it's the commonest tumor in women so that tells you how common it is in fact i've once had a colleague say to me if you had 10 women of a certain ethnic origin so i was focus now to women of African extraction. So be it African women, Afro-Caribbean women, Afro-American women, or even Afro-Latino women, mm. you would find that as many as 
eight in ten of those women will have fibroids. So that's wow. how we have common it is. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. I want everyone to be reassured <laughs> yeah. that look, you've got fibroids, it does not mean the end of the world. There's nothing to be alarmed about. We need <laughs> to look into it based on the symptoms that you might have that could be associated to the fibroids because sometimes the symptoms may have nothing at all to do with the fibroids and it could be something completely different. So oh. first things first, you've got a fibroid. Yes. How is it a sim how is it bothering you? How is it a problem to you? Is what we then need to look at. But we also do know that as much as women of African extraction uh, have this common tumor. Surprisingly, it's not so common in the Chinese, or should I say the Far Eastern, the Far, uh, Far East Asian women, so the mm -hmm. Chinese, Korean, and Japanese. Mm -hmm. And we think that it's not just about genetics. We also think maybe to a degree, there's something to do with the environment. There's something to do with even the food and other things we are exposed to. We're still trying to get to the bottom of it, but uh, let's keep posted as more yeah. research comes forward. Okay. Going on to how does it impact on you? I've said it there. In a lot of women, it will go unnoticed. So, yes, this lady has got a fibroid, but she's had it for years because they tend to grow very, very slowly. Except, of course, if something sinister is about happening but they tend to grow very, very slowly. And for years, go unnoticed with no major impact on, you know, the quality of life. And in some cases, it's been picked up on a scan. So I've had women come to me because they needed to have a pelvic ultrasound scan for some other reason. reason. And was then found to have a fibroid, uh, which may not necessarily be related to their symptoms. And then I've come to me to say, oh, I've been told I've got a two centimeter fibroid. Oh, mm. I've been told I've got a one and a half centimeter fibroid. Oh, what do I need to do? Do I need to do something very drastic? And then it takes a bit of, you know, trying to calm them down and reassure them and then guide and provide adequate information so they can make an informed decision. Okay. That's really interesting. How, how commonly or how common is that scenario where it is, um, you've come to do something else? I would say, I would say two to three in 10 women who come in, do not come in because they have a problem with it, but it was just because it was an incidental finding while it's been investigated for all the things. Okay, listen, let's go to the, let's go to one of the questions that we have here, because I think it sort of um, follows on nicely from what you've been saying. And I've not forgotten the last point on the slide where I would like us to really go into that later. But um, is this a good place to ask the first question that we have sort of, um, and I think you might want to discuss that with your next slide or the one before, but this is, what are the different types of fibroids? So you've explained to us what fibroids are um, and provide some background in terms of um, what, what, what it actually means, even though we throw the word tumor around fairly commonly, it's actually benign. So what are the different types of fibroids that, 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 you know, exist and how, how are they different in terms of symptoms and the way they impact overall health? So I wonder if it's something that you can speak to. I'm happy to move the slides back and forth for you if you need that. Great. I'll love us to go back to the previous slide. Okay. So I could then um, 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 correlate what I'm about to say. So different types of fibroids. We I will talk about fibroids based on their location first. Okay. And based on their location, you can see in that picture that um, there's a fibroid sat right in the middle of the um, cavity. Yes. So that you would call a submucous fibroid. But well, you can also see that it's got a little stalk to it. So it's got a very tiny, should I say, peduncle. Yes. At the edge. So it's not just a submucous fibroid, it's actually a pedunculated submucous fibroid. I'll tell yeah. you why that's important later. Okay. Then the other two fibroids you can see within the wall. So there's one on your, at least it's on my right anyway, <laughs> um, just underneath the ovary is also a sort of submucous fibroid which impinges, so it indents the uterine cavity without okay. fully getting into it. Okay. And you also would have those that sit within the muscle. So we call that intramural fibroid. So that's 
the one on both my left and my right. Yes. Um, that sits well within the muscle without indenting on the inner cavity or the outer wall. And we also have the last one called the subserosal fiber, which is the bit towards my left, mm -hmm. um, which is indenting onto the outside wall. Okay. Now, oftentimes, you find that the symptomatic fibroids, depending on what the symptoms are. So I tend to say with symptoms, um, we go by the rule of four. So one is a pressure symptom. Mm -hmm. the second is a bleeding symptom. So that mm -hmm. means it makes the menstrual cycles much heavier or longer, or in some cases, both at the same time. So heavy but and long periods. In a few women, particularly those who are going into the menopause or even gone into the menopause, they may get themselves having what we would define as postmenopausal bleeding or intermittent bleeding. Okay. So the um, subacus fibroids tend to be the guilty ones too because they increase the entire surface area of the uterus. And yes. imagine women would bleed for 30 to 80 mils, you know, every day in a regular menstrual cycle, cycle per day yeah but you find this in those with fibroids they tend to bleed much much heavier mm. sometimes depending on the size of the fibroids the size of the fibroids could increase the surface area to twice or sometimes thrice the original uterine area mm. and you can imagine with such a wide area being exposed to the usual menstrual cycle bleed you can imagine how much blood loss um, this woman would have yeah it's not um, a rare thing to see ladies become significantly anemic as a result of this long menstrual bleeds and therefore needing in a few cases in a very few cases um, blood transfusions or iron supplements to build up the iron stores again <laughs> so that's a submucous one the other okay. thing, again, with submucus is it also has an impact on fertility. So okay. remember what I said, pressure, bleeding, fertility. And then I would mention um, intimacy problems with mm. effect on function on the bowel or the bladder. Okay. So um, the submucus ones also can have a significant impact on fertility. Why? Because they by default act as a sort of intrauterine device mm. they're foreign body satin layer yes. you know and by default the uterus thinks look i'm not in any condition you know to receive a baby and even if a conception or conceptus was to form they would find it difficult to implant okay because it's made the environment rather hostile to any you know um conception concept yes, yes. You know, settling in yeah. so that's the second thing about subacus fibroids now with regards to um intimacy or with regards to impact on bowel or bladder it only depends on how big they are because if it's a small fiber for instance less than three four centimeters the likelihood of that having that sort of significant impact is much less okay. however if there were multiple fibroids which therefore make the entire uterine body, that's the entire womb, quite massive and quite mm. um, angled. You may well find that, yes, the woman has got a four centimeter fibroid, but is one of several other fibroids. Right, right. Located in different parts of the uterus and yeah. therefore has an impact. So she's okay. got a lot of fibroids located to the front, for instance, she may find that it always sits against the bladder Mm -hmm. because the uterus is angled to face forward and yes. therefore as a result of that it angles even furthermore to sit on the bladder, bladder and yeah. finds itself needing to pass water quite often yes. and vice versa if it's towards the back she the either back. gets constipated mm -hmm. or she gets overflow um diarrhea okay with intimacy intimacy becomes an issue if the fibroids are located towards the neck of the womb yes and that's because during the time of intimacy, mm. all she can feel is that big lodge or that mass moving mm -hmm. around, putting more strain on the suspension ligaments that hold onto the uterus. Mm. And that also puts a strain on the nerves that feed the organs in that area. So as a result of that, 
she feels extremely uncomfortable yeah so painful sex so you've talked about quite a lot of symptoms that women go through and we're just still just looking at one of the types of sub um, of fibroids that's the submucous or submucosal ones which as you said um, are the ones that come from the muscle but are butting into the womb in the in the cavity of the womb itself and you've talked about bleeding problems fertility problems and just now you're describing problems with um sexual intercourse that could happen okay that's great so um should we go on to the next type um i think that was the i'll just say yeah. one more which is yes. extremely important because in mm -hmm. fact a lot of women may not even realize they have fibroids until they run into problems with this particular problem which okay. is a shame is women who unfortunately have miscarriages yes whereby a large or a significantly sized fibroid just simply sits in the way and yeah. makes the environment rather hostile so this baby has managed to get implanted so this yes. conceptus has come all the way down the yes. tube manages to get implanted and you're like yay and you know and baby starts to grow and like yay but unfortunately at some point big bad brother fibroid says no way and unfortunately leads to um negative um events i think that's important Sorry to cut in, Dr. Tolu. I think that's important to reference because you talked about how it could affect fertility. So even getting pregnant and implantation in the first instance. But even if implantation did happen, there's still the possibility that because this fibroid is inside the womb, it could cause a miscarriage later, a few weeks later, when as the, the baby, the pregnancy is trying to grow, it's competing with, as you say, the big, big bad brother it's not a not funny but i understand your description there yeah <laughs> i do understand yeah go on please i i don't want to be seen as being um um so Guinness. we could say big bad sister as well oh. <laughs> <If I'm allowed. laughs> it's, it's big and bad whichever one you want to choose no problem <laughs> and then the last thing is sometimes fibroids could also have an impact on how we deliver the uh, how we deliver the baby the baby because if it's sat very low in the cervix it then forms an obstruction to the baby descending down when the woman goes into labor at the end of a pregnancy. So okay. it certainly has an impact in that regard as well. Okay. All right. So on to the next, um, the next type. So the so next time, mm -hmm. oh, sorry. <laughs> the next type is the um, intramural. And I would also, in the same you know, breath, also talk about the subserosal. Okay. The intramural fibroids don't tend to be much of a problem if they're small and they're few. They only tend to be a problem if they accrue and become quite significant. So you can have a woman who may have two or three intramural, which is basically in the muscle, on one side of the uterus. And therefore, because of the gravity, you know, the pull of gravity, the uterus gets slightly twisted on itself or it could lean forward or lean backwards. You know, mm -hmm. just because she's got quite a lot of intramural fibroids. And likewise, the same with um, the subserosal. The subserosal in itself is, doesn't tend to be too much of a problem. It doesn't tend to be too much of a problem other, from, other than from the pressure effect side of things. Yes. Um, some women will say to me, oh, I can feel something moving. When I move forward, I feel something roll forward. Yes. And when I lean back, I can feel something rolling to my back. Yes. Oftentimes, that tends to be the subserosal one, potentially pedunculated. Yes. Because that explains why there's so much movement. I think so, that's what you wanted to describe. You said that earlier that you'd explain. So you have like a little stalk that the yes. it's like a fruit, like a which of the fruits, orange fruit or any of the fruits hanging from the tree, and the fibroid is sort of dangling off that little stalk. Oh gosh, a lot of women do talk about that sensation of something moving. And um, you, you just explained it very nicely. Okay, fantastic. So now we know the different types of fibroids, um, different in terms of the how they could be located, different in types of whether they are um, attached to a stalk or just sitting directly or coming directly off the lining. Um, three main types, even though fibroids, all of the, all types of fibroids are coming from the womb muscle, but there are those that sort of shoot out of the um, the womb cavity. So that's the last one you were just talking about. That's the subserosal. And then they're the ones that are lying inside the muscle itself. So they're just sitting within the muscle. That's the intramural. And then the submucosal ones are the ones that grow from the muscle into, into the womb cavity. Those are the essential differences. And then some of them can be pedunculated um, or some are just sitting off. 
directly from the um, from the womb lining or from the surface of the womb. Okay, so we've talked about the different types. We've talked about the impact on overall health. Let's go to the next question, which I think is just related, and maybe you want to shed some light on this, which is typically how quickly do fibroids grow and what factors contribute to their growth? And I'm pretty sure I, I get asked this question a lot about shrinking fibroids because this is the problem isn't it the fibroids if, if they just sat there like two centimeter fibroids and they minded their own business then we'd be fine but they don't do that do they unfortunately some of them don't do that a lot of them are well behaved because remember what i said a lot of women will go through life without even realizing they've got fibroids except if it's picked up incidentally whilst being investigated for some other you know unrelated issue Mm. So how quickly do they typically grow? I would say they're slow growing. They are slow growing. But what becomes important is where they're located, you see, and the impact it has on the woman's symptoms. Mm -hmm. So for instance, a subserosal fibroid could be there for years, growing slowly, until it then gets big enough to then create pressure symptoms or impact on the bowel of the bladder. So and that would take years easily. Um, a, an intramural fibroid, I would say likewise, you know, and then I think with fibroids, the issue really sometimes is not even how quickly that one fibroid grows. The issue really is how many fibroids are growing because okay. if you were to look at a uterus, you would find different fibroids at different rates of growth. So you okay. will have the less than centimeter, the one to two centimeters, the three centimeters, you know, varying sizes, particularly in women of African extraction. Mm. It's, it's, uh, it's anecdotal. Um, when you compare the fibroids in women of African extraction as compared to women of other, you know, origins, you often find that the women of African extraction tend to have several fibroids. We have an idea why, but we are not completely sure why. But mm. they tend to have several fibroids as compared to women from other um, uh, ethnicities where they may get that singular or that solitary fibroid or maybe at the most two. You know. Okay. I don't know if you can see my screen but just as you were talking I was sharing images of um, um, fibroids from a single operation and just referencing what you were what you've been saying. Unfortunately I don't know where these ones were picked from which what types they were um, but they're different sizes and it, it just occurred to me as you were talking about how they can grow at different rates yeah. um, within the same woman and fibroids are just one of those there are many awful conditions in medicine but the, I think they're just one of the really you, when you can't understand them you don't understand what is it that influences they're in the same body under the same influence of whatever factors you want to say cause them how do they manage to do this so differently um, that's interesting so the factors that contribute to their growth would include a few things. Mm -hmm. So we know they're estrogen dependent. So a woman who has unopposed estrogen activity for years and years and years will unfortunately be prone to fibroids. The women that fall into this category are women who have never had children, obese or overweight ch um, women, mm -hmm. women who also, uh, should I say, have a high consumption of saturated fats was also being identified as a um, factor. We also know that women who have fibroids running in their family, so this is where the genetic predisposition comes into play, also are at risk. So those are some of the factors that contribute to their growth. So unopposed estrogen, so, you know, she's just been um, she's never had a, a, should I say, a timeout, so to speak, you know, and um, the fibers are being fed continually. And of course, how could I miss it? Alcohol and there is a spurious link with caffeine. Mm. We do know that um, for those who decide to go on a non-red meat diet, um, their fibroid sizes tend to relent. Okay. So it either stabilizes uh, and certainly does not grow as much as before. So avoiding red meat or should I say red beef certainly helps. Okay. Um, weight loss 
would also help because we do know, you know, um, women are curvy, but the curviness, unfortunately, releases a different type of um, estrogen. That's that female hormone I talked about earlier on. Okay. And that, unfortunately, helps with fibroid growth. Now, there have been studies to show that um, some herbal remedies may help with controlling it. So it may not necessarily cure it, but it might help in controlling it. But mm -hmm. I have to be very careful. I have to be careful to say here, with herbal remedies, you have to make sure you know who you're going to yes. to have this sort of you know therapy on board. Yes. So there have been comments about milk thistle, chase berry, and green tea. And I think this is really more to help balance the hormonal um, state of play. Yes. So it goes all the way back to unopposed estrogen. So it's all about challenging that estrogen and hopefully minimizing the source feeding the fibroids. Then in addition to that, we do know that, you know, when women are a little stressed, <laughs> Mm. It leads to some degree of hormone imbalance as well. So this is where yoga, exercises, breathing exercises with acupuncture becomes useful. Mm -hmm. And then there has been some evidence behind the use of traditional Chinese medicine. But all these are all adjunctive therapy. The focus really will be to manage it, you know. And I think I have that in another slide. Yes. With either by the use of hormones, which could yeah. be oral hormones, mm. um, the implants, Oh, let me um, cut in before before you go there because i would love you to talk about that i think that will come with the next question but you you made an interesting point and i'm glad you said that about not um, um going to a a nature therapist or an alternative or complementary therapist who knows what they're doing because a lot of what we're getting from ladies is we don't like these hormones um and we don't like the idea of surgery is there anything that i can take that's natural and unfortunately, um, and it's not just in fibroids treatment, it is everywhere in medicine. You have people who will, for want of a better word, peddle any kind of um, herbs or natural cures and say, oh, this is, this is all you need and you'll be fine, which is not, which is not, particularly, which is not particularly true. Um, so I'm just glad that you made that mention that these things, the right ones like milk thistle, chaseberry, green tea, could have some effect, but they don't cure. And if you're going to use this thing, speak to somebody who knows what they're talking about. So either they're registered where you stay or um, you're speaking with a medical practitioner who can monitor you. Because I, I hate the idea that women just go off drinking some tablets or sachets from somewhere. And is it doing anything? We don't know. But they're spending lots and lots of money. And a lot of times these things are quite expensive. So I'm really glad that you mentioned that. Um, I think to take us on um, to the next question, which is around treatment, let me go to that slide. But I right off um, on the earlier slide you talked about, I interrupted you when you were going to talk about the um, leiomyosarcoma. That's the last, um, you know, last sentence on this slide. Do you want to just mention this and its relevance? Because um, some women do ask a lot about fibroids and cancer. So could you just share some light on this and how we should be thinking about fibroids should we never ever mention cancer when it comes to fibroids what should we know what should our women know real so um they never how do i put it i'll never never ever ever <laughs> <No intention. laughs> that's a medical school didn't they <laughs> never never. Yes. never say never <laughs> you know so i'll never ever oh never mention that there is a risk of a tumor because particularly for those who have no should i say symptoms they need to know what to look for in order to raise alarm or to at least come calling at our doors for monitoring or surveillance because for many women the surveillance actually sits with them because if you've got no symptoms i'm not going to see you neither will your general practitioner see you but you've got to know what to look for so you can then raise alarm and come in and knock on our door so we can help you. Now, leiomyosarcoma is when the fibroids go rogue. It's not very common. You can see the figures I have there. It's about four in, let's say, 100,000 or even a million, to be honest. And you can see the variation. So you've got 0 0.4 to 0 0.64. I believe that's 100,000, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. So you're talking of 4 to 64 in a million women. 
mm, that have fiber. Right. So it is rare. However, we are beginning now to see, maybe because of all the phytoestrogens that are bound in our environment, we're beginning to see a few more per year. Or maybe it's just, you know. Are we recording chat. them more? Or Yeah, okay. You know, but we don't know. And that would also be explained by the variation. So in some places, you would see four in a million. In other places, you see, you know, 6.4 in a million. So it's, it's a bit... Um, what's the word? It's a bit, um, yeah, it's 6.4, isn't it? Yes, yes, yeah, 6.4 because most, in, yeah, in a million, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so yeah, it's it's a bit, um, variable, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that when this transition occurs, they tend to be more commonly in sub serosal fibroids because remember what I said about sub serosal fibroids, mm -hmm. except they are large, yeah, and they're pedunculated that exert a bit more of the pressure symptom you often don't even realize they're there okay the submucosal ones are symptomatic because you, you know the woman gets the pain she gets the bleeding she gets you know the infertility and also the miscarriages yes. but the submucosal ones sorry yeah so sorry, sorry sub serosal ones which is outside of the wall of the bone often go unnoticed mm -hmm. it's only when they get large enough that it becomes an, a bit of an issue we also know that we tend to see this transition in the older woman. And guess what? We also know that in that solitary lesion, which suddenly starts to grow pretty quickly, then you need to be asking yourself, is there a rogue change going on here? Okay, so what are we saying to what are we saying to our ladies um, about leiomyosarcomas? Um, and I know that there is there might be a little bit of difference in thinking because some um, some of us scientists or medics will say um, it's a different, it's a completely different kind of lesion or condition, and some will say, as you're say, um, suggesting here, that actually some fibroids could eventually or could become or transition to leiomyosarcomas, but Whichever way, the, the, the woman just wants to know what is she supposed to be doing. Because as you said, she's not going to come to you. Somebody who has a, who's had a sub serosal fibroid for donkey's years, doesn't give her any problems. What, what, what should she do then? Because she's not going to end up in your clinic um, and she may not end up with me either. So what is it that she's supposed to do? Is there anything that we as generalists really, should we be holding on to these ladies the way we do for... Um, um, for example, let's say if you're on HRT, we might say to you that we want to make sure you're doing your breast checks every uh, frequently, or we want to do certain, you know, check your blood pressure every so often. Should we be holding on to these ladies? What should we be saying on saying to them? I think if if a fibroid is of a considerable size, then yes, it might be useful maybe to scan them ever so often. Okay. And what, what do I mean by considerable size? I would say certainly anything over five, six, seven, possibly even 10 centimeters, to be honest. Okay. Maybe it might be useful to at least just keep an eye on them, maybe on a yearly basis. Okay. However, I have to say this is only anecdotal, you know, um, information. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it really should still boil down to the woman. We still have to individualize the care for the woman. Okay. I certainly will advise if I know this lady has fibroids or a huge or a significant fibroid anyway, I would want to advise some sort of intervention. Except if she says to me very clearly, I have no symptoms and I'm not prepared to take on the side effects of intervention. Yeah. But like I said, you, you've got to take it out on a case by case basis. I do not want to be, um, it's not a one size fits all mm. per se. True. True. However, okay. from the leiomyosarcoma point of view, I would suggest that given that they tend to be sub serosal in an older lady with a faster growth, oftentimes you will get some degree of abdominal distension. Yes. Some and symptoms will happen. Yes. Something would happen. And yes. oftentimes because she's an older lady with abdominal distension, the person that comes to mind is what? Ovarian cancer. Ovarian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So by mm -hmm. default, she's already mm -hmm. having some sort of intervention. By she will need a stand. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Exactly yeah so okay at that point in time you know having a look at the scan and then seeing how it's been typified will be useful Lions okay. and Pomes, thankfully are not a well they they are they're not nice tumors to have 
So she mm. says they're not nice cancers to have. But mm. you often find that even how rare they are, the likelihood that they're aggressive and they grow very quickly um, is not that well documented. Is what okay. I was Okay. All right. That's great. So um, it's something, it, it, it exists. It's a very, very, very small chance, 6.4 in a million. But it's something that we should be aware of. And in terms of sudden change in symptoms, sudden symptoms developing, and they could be tummy, your tummy uh, um, swelling or developing um, abdominal or pelvic pain um, problems with urine or constipation. Maybe those are the things that could bring one to the attention and then of a doctor and then we'll do scans to work that out. Okay, that's fantastic. So we have, this is such an interesting conversation and we I know we could spend hours really talking about all this, but we haven't got hours, unfortunately. But I think we've covered a lot of some of the questions that we have here. So I think we're going to just run through the next few ones and then refer to the slides as we go on. So the next one is now on treatment and the question says what are the chances of fibroids recurring after treatment and what can be done to minimize the likelihood of treatment of recurrence so of course for this you'd want to talk about what treatments are available and then <laughs> and then you can sort of narrow into what can be done to minimize the likelihood of recurrence so so what are your thoughts please so with treatment of course we need to even know where they are and what they are in the first place so we normally would tend to do it with a pelvic scan sometimes you might need to get an MRI organized to further typify, particularly if we think there's a lyomyosarcomatose change here. And in some um, in some climbs, um, PET um, scans are used with benefit. With treatment, there are no symptoms, absolutely do nothing. Mm -hmm. So all I'm doing is reassuring you as a patient to say, look, you've got, yes, a centimeter, 1.5 centimeter fiber, and make you understand how common that is and how actually um, benign it is. And with that, not to worry at all about doing anything, particularly if it's a lady who is coming to the end of a reproductive years. Because remember what I said, they are estrogen dependent. So chances yes. are, once you get into the menopause, most probably the fibroids will start to shrink and eventually become nothing to be concerned about now for those who are symptomatic you need to see what symptoms they are and how to then sort it out now for those who've got small fibroids who have the bleeding you know discomfort during menstrual periods it may well be that those fibroids will be amenable to hormonal therapy so before going into hormonal therapy just you know the um, supportive therapy of um, tranexamic acid, which helps mm -hmm. to limit or reduce the bleeding, bleeding and also yeah. painkillers, which yeah. helps to uh, mitigate the pain and mm -hmm. with iron supplements, if, you know, she was anemic. A little anemic, will yes. be useful. Otherwise, we're looking at more hormonal therapy whereby, you know, we talk about a mini pill or preferably the combined pill if it's allowable. The Myrena is a useful agent of mine because guess what? It sits there for four to five years, even though the license is for as many as seven years. And what does it do? We know that it helps to shrink fibroids. So if the fibroid size is less than four centimeters and we're able to put a Myrena coil in, that's the hormone coil in fairly easily. Certainly that would be my go-to for many women because it's there. You don't have to worry about it. Just yes. get some I think, that's an interesting, I think that's an interesting sell to many women because um, I'm sure you know this as well, Dr. Tolu, that a lot of the feeling is that when we put women on these hormones, they actually say to us, um, or I've heard people say, well, I had um, bad bleeding and then my doctor put me on the pill and I'm, I'm sure that's what caused my fibroids because of this slant of the hormone effect on fibroids. So there is that fear and it's a good thing that you've said um that putting the myrena for example which which is the progesterone coil the progesterone iud um can help to shrink fibroids and so you're treating a number of things there you're treating bleeding problem you're helping to reduce the size of the fibroid and for a woman who needs it that also works as her birth control that, and there is a lot of fear um, that women have about just having these hormone therapies many women have really bad side effects it is true but some women do have very it makes a change. It actually makes a difference for their lives. And I think it's good to have a balanced conversation and so a balanced view about the effects that these could have. 
Definitely. I completely agree to that. And I often say to the women that ever since the Myrina has come into, should I say, regular use, you can see that there has been certainly a reduction in the number of hysterectomies, for instance, because why the Marina serves as an effective agent for a lot of things. So for the woman, we still, you know, seeking contraception whilst deciding how to complete a family, it serves it. For the woman who's having a bit of heavy bleed, maybe not sometimes not even related to fibroids, maybe related to adenomyosis, stroke endometriosis, the Marina sucks that out. For mm -hmm. the woman who's got pain because of her endometriosis, oh, guess what? The Marina. Does and, then, for the, and then for the woman who then eventually wants to go down the route of HRT once she's finished her period, but she wants to protect the lining of her womb from developing rogue cells, guess what? The Myrena. Oh, <laughs> did I even mention? For the woman who wants a sterilization <laughs> because she has completed the family, guess what? The Myrena. Oh, what? dear. <laughs> because... A sterilization carries a one in 200 okay, chance of failure. A marina is actually half of that. Hmm. So I tend to say to them, please, this may be your best buddy for <laughs> you know, the time being or even for years to come. Okay. You have to tolerate the side effects, which often eventually will settle within six months or thereabout. Mm -hmm. That is a trial period. But once you're able to tolerate those side effects, you'll be very surprised how wonderful this, mm -hmm. you know, agent is in helping to control all the other issues. Mm -hmm. I will make a mention here about surgery because I want to then answer the question about um, recurrence after treatment. Yes, yes. Remember, sorry, remember what I said earlier that sometimes for some women, they just don't have one fibroid. They may have as many as two or three or four fibroids mm -hmm. at different levels of growth. Mm -hmm. Now, for treatment to completely get rid of fibroids, we're looking at surgery. To reduce it and shrink it, yes, we're looking at hormones because you've got to remember that little bird is still there. Mm -hmm. However, just because you've had a myometomy, which is basically a cut in the tummy, it could be a big cut or a little cut, depending yes. on whether we want to do it via keyhole or yes. we're doing it via big cut. Mm -hmm. Just because you've had a myomectomy of one or two fibroids is not to say that there are siblings still sat within the womb, which may yet develop into of bigger course. fibroids yeah. in the next few years. Of course. So women have to understand that when they're going down the route of surgery. And which is one of the reasons why I would say if you catch the fibroids early and you're beginning to become a bit symptomatic, maybe actually the hormones may help you if you're not looking to actively try for children. Have the hormones on board to keep it stable or preferably to shrink it depending okay. when you need to have surgery, if you need to have surgery at all. Okay. Okay, so that's really that's really useful. I think that's the whole um, discussion that women need to have when they're talking about the treatment and expectations, especially after surge, after myomectomy, of course, from the point of view of hysterectomy, you're not talking about fibroids recurring. Thank you so much for that. So let's move on to the next question. And I know that you've touched this um, in terms of the discussion that we've had so far. And it's simply, what is your point of view for lifestyle changes and dietary modifications? So let me just come back to this slide and see if you wanted to add anything else to this point, which I think you'd made earlier um, about anything that women can do that are not hormones. They're not surgery. They're not even the surgery alternatives like the radiological in, um, 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 interventions like UFE or um, um, MRI guided focused ultrasound treatments. What, what else can we be doing um, to help uh, with, with fibroids? So, like I mentioned earlier on, I think diet is important. Mm -hmm. Certainly, maintaining a healthy weight or weight. healthy diet and exercise is very important. It helps with the state of mind. It helps to distress, which we know is quite related to hormone imbalance. Mm -hmm. And, of course, with the diet, we talk about the saturated fats and red beef, trying to minimize that as much as possible. I wouldn't say to you, take it completely out, but if you're able to minimize it as minimize. much as possible, fine. I've had women who have gone vegetarian swear by their diets that, you know, being vegetarian has certainly helped with their fibroid reduction. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm still waiting for more evidence. But they swear by it. It's their experience. And guess what? I will not take that away from them. Absolutely. It's a work for them. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and I know that there is a growing call for um, women with regards to hair products, particularly for the African, uh, for women of the African extraction. Yeah. You know, so we're talking about the hair products um, to, um, to um, relax the hair or to make the hair straighter, so to speak. Uh, we talk about the Lyle and the no Lyle products, yes. um, which are thought to have an impact on estrogen, estrogen imbalance mm -hmm. and therefore increasing the risk of fibroids. I would say the evidence is very uh, contra contradictory. Um, no. I have met colleagues of mine who are very passionate about this. And who would say certainly, you know, there's growing evidence, but they feel maybe the industry has a part to play in it. I don't know. I'm not even going to go into those waters. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go into those waters. But at the moment, do we have, you know, overwhelmingly strong evidence? I will say not yet. We yeah. still need to have more studies. We still need to have larger numbers. Mm -hmm. you know to be able to say categorically statistically yes indeed this is um maybe a factor and it may well be genetics has a part to play because uh, yeah in my mind i'm thinking not every woman who uses this product develops a fiber mm -hmm. so why are some women a bit more prone to it and we know yes yeah, certainly that's um genetics has a part to play sometimes in some of those conditions or diseases so I think there's more evidence coming in and hopefully research will be able to help us out in the next few years, particularly with the, is it the gene sequencer? Yes. You know, you, you know submit your data in and wait to, to hear what diseases one is prone to and, um, you know, so that may well change the playing field with regards yeah. to that. There is a lot of work going on and um, I was looking at a paper recently talking about the different um, gene modifications, DNA associations, DNA insults that um, they are, are suspected to be um, related with fibroids. And there's a whole lot of work to be doing. But then the other thing as well, and I think that's another kettle of fish, which I don't really want us to open at this point, is getting people, particularly of African extraction, to participate in these trials so that we actually get the information that's relevant to us. Yes. Um, and that is an issue. But let's, you know, let's not, that's not the you know, intention for today's um, uh, today's talk but that is an important issue because we don't know exactly what causes fibroids we've talked about lots of different associated factors but we're not sure exactly what is it that makes this happen in one person and not the next person and so on okay fantastic so let's go on to the last question as we round up our discussion because we've covered quite such so much really in terms of discussion um, and so this question is really about if somebody has fibroids, um, as you say, a lot of us can find out when we're being investigated for something else. Something else takes us to have a scan and they say, oh, there's a 2CM fibroid. So this question is about how do I know if my fibroids require immediate medical intervention or if it's just better to watch and wait? And um, are there any risks for delaying treatment, which of course there will be depending on the type of fibroid? Um, but assuming it's not really causing any problem, is, is, does, it, does it really matter? What, what would you say as a gynecologist now, um, what would you be saying to a woman who's got this question in her head? Do I need to do anything? How do you relate that to her age and you know whether she's peri or premenopausal and so on? I think with this question, as much as I like to uh, give a generalized opinion, I have to be careful because I know it's, uh, it's a case of um different strokes for different folks why do i say this because sometimes it may well be at that conversation with her general practitioner or gynecologist or even in some cases sexual health you know counselor that she reflects and then realizes that she's not as um bereft of symptoms as she would like to think i'll give an example um, a lady noticed that once she turned about 19, 20, her periods got heavier. And she noticed that she was having to go through packs, several pads at a, at a point in time. 
but because she could cope with it and she changed her diet so that her diet provided that extra um, um, supplement she needed to help replenish um, the effects of her anemia. She just got on with things. But mm. she said to me that any time she was having periods, wow, she felt washed out. Wow. And so then she ended up having a pelvic scan and then picking up um, fibroids on the pelvic scan. So for that sort of woman, you were to ask her, oh, your fibroids, uh, are they symptomatic or are they problematic? She might say to you, no. Why? Because from the age yeah. of 20, she's always been used to having yeah. periods. Yeah, she's gotten used to them. Hmm. You know. So in her mind, it's always been heavy. Oh, yes, I sometimes I have to take a day off work, but that's always been me. When in actual fact, it's a symptom of the fibroid. So I've got to be very, very careful to say, oh, well, if it's not causing you any problems, leave it, leave it alone. Because <laughs> I think having that consultation first, where someone can actually, with their body of knowledge, go through all the different forms of presentation and then say okay categorically well you know what you don't have any bleeding issue here you have no position or pressure issue here you've got no um, pressure in the surrounding organs no fertility concern or even you know miscarriages or problems at birth so on that basis live well alone and let's see how things go and then again in addition to that we also have to look at how many fibroids are we looking at here? So is it a multi-fibroid uterus? How big is a uterus? You know, is it having any impact on all the things? And uh, yes, like you rightly mentioned, where does this woman sit? If this was a 19, 20 year old with a five centimeter fibroid, I might want to be doing something as mm. compared to a 45 year old or a 50 year old who is, you know, coming to the end of a reproductive, you know, should I say life cycle. So is got to be individualized the care has got to be individualized because sometimes yeah. patients do not know really how to tackle this so certainly yeah. having a, a deep chat or should i say um, um i won't say intimate actually but a deep <laughs> or a deep conversation deep conversation <laughs> yeah. with your health provider really um, will be very useful to identify any um symptoms that may not be so overt yes that's amazing. I'm glad you said that because automatically we would have thought, well, um, if it's small, don't bother. So it actually you need to t t take each lady as an as a person, sit her down and actually work out what is going on, get that baseline established, and that would help us decide if we need to do anything or not. Okay, that is amazing. Dr. Tolu, that is really, I'm, I've learned so much actually. I know I talk a lot about fibroids, but I'm so glad that we've had this chat because it's good to of bounce of ideas and see from your own point of view when you're sitting in the clinic and we send to you people who probably have had symptoms for years and that we can't do anything about in the community and then so it's now up to you to decide right which of these options um would be useful i'm also glad that you've talked about diet because um, i think a lot of women have sort of given up on traditional care and think that all we're going to sell to them is myomectomy hysterectomy hormones um, but even though the evidence is is growing, um, it's not as big as with surgery and other options, there is evidence that your diet can have some impact. Still some areas of controversy, it's agreed. But if you're going to go for a plant-based diet or Mediterranean diet, it will help your overall health. It's not going to cause you any harm, as will consuming moderately that is going to help your overall health. So that's not going to do you any wrong and that would could potentially help your fibroids. But I think the important thing is that we're looking at holistic interventions. We're not just looking at one thing or the other. So thank you, it's been an amazing discussion. In the last minute, is there anything that you would just, that's on your mind, you know, for Fibroids Awareness Month, what is it that you want your patients to be aware of? What is, as a gynecologist, what is, something that's on your heart you think this is what i want my ladies to be aware of when it comes to fibroids i think first and foremost do not get um burdened or do not get her lapped. yes fibroids yes um it's concerning but guess what they're rather common and you may well mm -hmm. find that the symptoms um you're having is not really as alarming as you'd like to to think it is 
get help from your healthcare provider and engage as much as you possibly can. And then for those who are interested in research or in being part of the research, I think certainly it's a good call for women of African extraction to be involved because yeah. we do know anecdotally as specialists over in the hospital that the fibroids behave differently. Hmm. We don't know why, but they behave yeah. differently. You know, I have a Caucasian lady walk in front of me and I have a woman of African extraction walk in front of me. I do not expect their fibroids to behave the same way. Wow. <laughs> My so, goodness. That's another kind of worms. <laughs> That's another kind of worms. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Amazing. So guys, I hate to round up this conversation. I wish we could just sort of keep Dr. Tolu and just, you know, ask her all the questions that we want to ask. But no, we can't. But we've had a lovely hour of conversation around this subject. We're almost an hour anyway. Um, and I know you found it of great value. Um, again, if you do have any questions you want to clarify, please use our email health information service. The link will be in the description box from this video or um, for this video. Um, and any question, really, we'd be happy to cover with you. If you have fibroids or you have some curiosity about some of the things that we've talked about today, you can comment down in the section, in the comments box below. Please don't forget to like this video and of course to subscribe to the channel. Dr. Tolu is on Instagram as at VolvaDoc. She shares a lot of useful information regarding the work that she's doing. So please go ahead and follow her there. Go and check her out on um, at VolvaDoc. Of course, we are at Ask Away Health on Instagram. And so we'd love to see you and hear from you from time to time. So guys, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Dr. Tolu, thank you again for spending you, a little bit of your time. Thank you with us today. And hopefully we'll see you again. It's an open invitation. I think we'll see you again soon anyway to talk more about this um, as we mark Fibroids Awareness Month. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the great work you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, guys. See you again soon.